Hello and welcome to the final film in the series about the higher level atomic structure topic. Um, here we're going to be trying to explain some of the things that we've seen in the standard level and higher level parts of this topic. Um, in particular, when we looked at the emission spectra and the ionization energies of um, atoms and electrons. So hopefully by the end of this film you'll know what something called the convergence limit is. Um, where you'd find it in an emission spectrum and how we can link it to the ionization energy of an electron in an atom. And we're also going to try and explain something that we've touched on in the past and that is these blips that we see when we look at the first ionization energies of atoms in a period. And we're going to try and do that with particular reference to the subshells and orbitals that we've been looking at up until now. So let's start off with a little reminder of what causes an emission spectrum. So um, we've got electrons that get excited to higher energy levels. That might be by heat or light. But the uh, point about these is that when these electrons then relax back down to their ground state or where they would normally be, they emit that energy in the form of light. And the wavelength or the frequency of that light that they emit corresponds to the difference in energy between the two energy levels that they're traveling between. Okay, and you might remember seeing this diagram here, which showed us that as well as emission, we can have absorption, and the energies will be very similar because they're transitions between the same energy levels, but absorption is electrons going up from low ones to high ones, whereas emission is electrons falling down from high energies to low energies. And what you might have noticed when you first saw this diagram was that there was something about ionization here. Now if you think about what's going on here, if you promote an electron from the, say, from the first shell to the second or to the third or to the fourth, you can imagine promoting it to the hundredth or to the thousandth. And in fact, there will come a limit. In fact, there will uh, be a, a shell beyond which we can't go. Or we can go beyond that shell to do so would be to remove the electron from the atom completely. So if we say that there is an infinite number of shells in an atom, we can figure out how much energy is required to go from a particular shell to that infinite shell. And if we do anything more than that, then we will have ionized the atom. That is to say, we'll have removed an electron from it completely. Now, you also might remember that this diagram gave, gave us a kind of visual um, explanation of why it is that the lines in this emission spectrum got closer and closer together as we got to higher and higher energies or shorter and shorter wavelengths and that's because each of the each successive higher energy level is closer to the one before it than was the case the previous time okay so in other words these energy levels are getting closer and closer together as we get towards this infinite level now, if we think about what that means for our spectrum, if we look at the emission spectrum here rather than the absorption spectrum up the top, then we might expect that the lines would be getting closer and closer and closer until they got so close together that they actually started to converge and just form one continuous band. Now, eventually, we will get to a limit beyond which we can't go without removing the electron completely. So this is the infinite shell. Okay. So at the point at which these lines converge, at the limit of that convergence, so the convergence limit, we can measure the wavelength or the frequency of the light that was needed to take the electron from this lower shell up to that shell. And by doing so, we can figure out how much energy was required to do that. Okay, so the key points that we've covered here is, as we know before, there's a difference in energy between levels, and therefore, if you think about it, there must be a difference in energy between, say, the first level and this infinite level that we've talked about. Okay, and we can find what this difference is by looking at the light that we see at the convergence limit in our spectrum. Okay. Remember that the differences in energy can correspond to certain frequencies or wavelengths of light. And we've got a formula for relating the energy of a photon that causes the movement of an electron or is caused by the movement of an electron 
we can relate its energy to the frequency of the light, the nu here, or as some people would write, E equals HF, so representing frequency as F instead of nu. Okay, so E is equal to the frequency multiplied by something called Planck's constant. Okay, now Planck's constant is on the IB data sheet, so as long as you can multiply Planck's constant by the frequency of the light, then you can find the energy that is required to get to this convergence limit. And if you can do that, then you have found the ionization energy. You've found how much energy is required to remove an electron completely from the atom. So that was that. Now we'll go on to explaining something um, that we touched on in the past, but not in a great deal of detail. And you might remember seeing this graph here, which shows us that as we go and measure the first ionization energy of each of the first 20 elements, we see some patterns as we go across periods. So first period, we get a gradual rise. Second period, we get a gradual rise. Third period, we get a gradual rise. But there were some exceptions to be spotted, okay? And they seem to happen at these points here, between groups 2 and 3, and groups 5 and 6. And we, as I say, we had a quick go at explaining this earlier, but we're going to try and do it in a little bit more detail and refer to the subshells and orbitals that we've looked at before. So let's have a look at the first dip. That was between beryllium and boron. Let's remind ourselves of how many electrons these things have. So beryllium, the fourth element, has four, and boron, the fifth, has five. That means that we can put the electrons into boxes remember these boxes are the orbitals, and in doing so we can come up with electron configurations. So beryllium would have 4, and it would have 2 in 1s, and 2 in 2s, and we could write that as an electron configuration, right? If we had another electron to put in, then, as we do in boron, then we'd have to put it in 2p, and so we would have this electron configuration now for boron. Now, if you think about where the outermost electron is coming from, if we take one from beryllium or if we take it from boron, then we can see that in beryllium it's coming from the 2s orbital and in boron it's coming from one of the 2ps. Now, if you think about the energy of these two subshells or orbitals, we can see that the energy of 2p is higher. So that means the electron is less stable in that subshell, and so it's easier to remove than if it had been in a lower energy subshell. You can also think about the shape of these orbitals. Okay, and so there's a p orbital projecting outside of the spherical s orbital. So because the electron is spending a lot of time further away from the nucleus than it would have been in the s, it's going to be easier to remove it if it's in the p subshell. This other dip that we saw was between groups 5 and 6, so nitrogen and oxygen, for example. Okay, nitrogen with its seven electrons and oxygen with eight. Again, putting the electrons into boxes, we can say something about the electron configurations. But what's more important in this case is seeing what is happening with pairing. Now, nitrogen's got seven electrons, okay? So we can put those seven into these, and th or more importantly, these three electrons into these separate p orbitals and avoid pairing them up. Remember, Electrons don't like pairing up unless they have to. If you give an atom an eighth electron, like with oxygen, you've got no choice. You've got to put one into an orbital and pair it up with another. And remember, that causes a repulsion. So if, two electro if an electron is being repelled by another electron, we might expect it to be easier to remove than an electron that wasn't being repelled at all. So this allows us to explain why oxygen's first electron is a bit easier to remove than nitrogens, because oxygen's first electron experiences this repulsion that's caused by the pairing inside an orbital. So just to summarize the key points there, it's easier to remove electrons from higher energy subshells than it is from lower energy subshells. This, this, so for example, it's easier to remove electrons from 2p than it is from 2s. So that's why it's easier to remove electrons from boron and beryllium, or why there's a dip between groups 2 and 3. There's a dip between groups 5 and 6 because it's harder to remove an electron from an atom with a half full subshell, which elements in group 5 will have, than it is to remove an electron from the next atom along because that one will have paired electrons in one of the orbitals and that spin pairing gives rise to a repulsion.
Okay, so these are the things we were trying to cover in this film. Hopefully they've made sense to you, but as usual, if you've got any questions or comments, please make sure you come and see me as soon as you can, or post a comment on YouTube, because that way other people can see your questions and learn from them as well.